afternoon, everybody, to this week's Saddleback webinar. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational. As usual, we are starting our broadcast a little bit early today to give you some time to log on and get comfortable. This screen here has some valuable information for you. Uh, we'll start our uh, content right at 3 o'clock Eastern time, but in the meantime, please make sure you are able to locate your control bar. It should be on the right-hand side of your web browser window. This is what's going to allow you to interact with us today, asking questions, downloading any handouts and resources that we have there for you. So please make sure that you are able to locate that. In addition, a lot of you probably want to know, am I going to get a certificate of attendance today? The answer to that is yes. Yes, you are absolutely going to get a certificate of attendance. However, that is not attached. We email that to you at the conclusion of our webinar today. So about two to three hours after our webinar concludes, an email will go out and that will have um, all of the handouts and it will have a recording of the webinar today and it will have the certificate of attendance so if you uh, for some reason are not able to find your control bar today and you're interested in getting the handouts we're going to send all of that to you so don't worry also while you're getting settled in make sure you follow us on twitter today saddleback can be found at 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 SDLback, that's our Twitter handle, and our guest, Dr. Katie McKnight, you can follow her at Literacy World. So while you're waiting and getting settled in, if you have your phone nearby, go ahead and tweet. Let everybody know that you're taking part in this great learning opportunity today, and we will get started shortly. In the meantime, let's say hi to our guest today. How are you today, Katie? I'm great. You know, I I, I was I was doing what you um asked uh had dutifully i was dutifully going on to twitter <laughs> oh <laughs> right sorry to to that. tweet out no it's okay to tweet out and say yo hanging out with saddleback this afternoon so i'm about to do that right now okay well i'm going to take this screen back for a minute because i know we have people joining us this is a very important screen uh so people know how they can uh how they can access the q a and how they can find the handouts and if you are just joining us don't worry, we'll go back in a minute so you can get the Twitter handles and you can interact with us that way. But please, please, please do follow us. We love to hear from you. And it's just a great way to keep the conversa conversation going today uh, throughout our, our learning. So I wonder uh, where everybody's joining us from today. Sometimes we get some international folks. So if you're joining us from outside of the United States, Welcome. We're glad to have you. We're glad to have everybody. I'm hoping that at least in the northern states that it's starting to warm up a little bit. Uh, down here in Texas, it's um, been quite warm already, so can't complain about that. Katie, where are you today? I am logging in from Fort Myers Beach, Florida. So, but I'm I'm actually uh, a native Midwesterner. So this is the first winter that I've been lucky enough to snowbird in Florida, and it's a little bit longer than than we thought it would be <laughs> because of the stay in <laughs> order. Yeah, we didn't expect to be here, you know, through probably June, and then I'll be heading back up north again, hopefully in time to to plant my tomatoes. So. Oh yes, yeah. Yep. Um, I tried planting tomatoes this year. So far, so good. Knock on wood. I don't want to. I don't oh, want to nice. do anything, but I might actually get some tomatoes that I can actually eat. So we'll see. We'll see about that. Nice. So it looks like our uh, numbers are climbing. If you are just joining us, please make sure you locate your control bar on the right-hand side of your web browser, and this is where you're going to find your handouts as well as be able to uh, interact with us today and ask questions. If you are wondering whether or not you will get a certificate of attendance, we will mail those out. We'll email those out to you a few hours after the conclusion of our webinar today. One email will go out with the certificate, with the link to the recording, uh, as well as with um, the handouts that you see attached here in your control panel. And don't forget, follow us on Twitter. Here is the Twitter information you will need to interact with us today. Uh, I, we always like to do this because we do start our broadcast a little bit early. We give people a chance to follow us and uh, connect with each other on Twitter and let people know that you are getting ready to learn with Dr. McKnight today. So we'll get started in about three minutes. 
Let's go there because I want to see where everybody's joining us from today. Hey, Rose. I see Rose is online. I've seen Rose a bunch um, I, I, here and there on different webinars that that I've been participating in. And then my good friend, Amy Davenport, who's uh, from the great state of Texas as well. Oh, up there. Region 10. Yeah, Region 10. We know Amy. Hi, Amy. Welcome. Oh, okay. You know Amy too? I oh, do, right. yes. They do some awesome work there in Region 10. Um, they sure do. Yeah. And let's see, I'm seeing, oh gosh, we got Iowa, somebody, oh, somebody from BVI, hey. Oh, I. I think it's Leisha. Uh, I've seen you around too online, so welcome. So we got British Virgin Islands is in the house. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Welcome. Arizona, yeah. El Paso, Texas. El Paso, all right. Yep. I was just getting ready to ask you who else is from, from Texas. Yeah, and let's see. Oh gosh, pretty much everywhere. So New Orleans, West Virginia. Awesome. You know, and that's the thing. It's just, you know, I, you know, I, I keep trying to think of, you know, the glass is half full, right? And one of the things that's resulted in this pandemic is that, you know, I've, I'm not running around in airports so much like I usually do. I usually take like, um, last year it was 155 flights last year. Oh, and wow. so, yeah, for me to not be on a plane in two and a half months is really kind of odd. And, and so the wonderful thing is, is that, you know, it's, it's, created the space, the time to just connect with colleagues. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. That's one of the super positive things that has come out of the pandemic. I absolutely agree with that. I, don't, I didn't travel quite as much as, as you, but I, there's some <laughs> traveling involved with my job. And uh, it's, it has been nice to kind of connect with people in a different way through these webinars and through these uh, opportunities to connect virtually for PD. It's been really nice. Uh, I, so I agree with you on that. Yeah, and, and just the accessibility too. So um, definitely. We've all gotten so proficient too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I'm getting more and more comfortable every week, which is which is nice. And it, I think people too are feeling better about learning in this format. It's definitely a change and it's definitely a process, but people are slowly becoming, I'm assuming, becoming more, more comfortable with interacting in this manner. Well, it is three o'clock. Eastern time on the nose. So mm -hmm. let us officially begin. Welcome everybody. I am Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational. Today we are going to be talking about the reading gap and how we can close it. And to help us out with this topic today, we have very special guest, Dr. Catherine McKnight is with us. And I never trust myself to memorize the bios. So <laughs> let me give you a formal introduction and let everybody know a little bit about you. So Dr. McKnight, she is a dynamic presenter, dedicated teacher, and an award-winning author. She began her career in education over 30 years ago. She was a middle school and high school English and social studies teacher in Chicago public schools. And in addition to speaking at professional development conferences, she is a regular consultant in schools and classrooms in the United States and internationally. She is the founder of Engaging Learners, an educational company, an, an educational company built around her successful literacy and learning center, center model, which is very cool. Her work in educational leadership, literacy, and student skill development has resulted in unprecedented academic achievement in many struggling schools. She has authored 20 books that support educational strategies to engage all learners, including literacy and learning centers for the big kids, grades four through 12. I, among many others, but I just mentioned that one because that's kind of my favorite. So, um, so we are so very thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and give you the power so you can share yeah, your screen. Yeah, with us. Power now. Now we're in trouble. Let me go. Ahead. Yeah, I'm always like, I can't walk and chew gum, right? So, <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm going to show my screen and. So awesome. Hey, one of the things I wanted to start with is that, you know, when I was preparing for today, uh, many of you filled out the questionnaire for the registration. And I want to thank you for that because that gives me some um, insight and understanding as to who is going to be participating in the webinar. And a lot of you are English language uh, teachers, are, are ELL teachers. And, uh, you know, my background 
actually is I've taught a lot of English language learners have been involved in that community. My mom, as a matter of fact, I'm a second generation teacher and my mom uh, was one of the first teachers back in the day when they called it TESOL uh, to be certified in the state of Illinois. She was uh, one of just, I think, three in the Chicago Public Schools back in the 70s. So she was a real, you know, pioneer, um, a, a groundbreaking kind of kind of person. And I hope that I've followed in her footsteps as well. Um, but that's always been part of, of my educational being and, and working with um, uh, students with uh, di diverse language uh, backgrounds. So, so I just wanted to give a shout out because I did notice that on, on the questionnaire and, and your responses. So I wanted to thank you for that. And, and most of all, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Yay. So, and all that you do on behalf of students. Um, ours is the only profession that I can think of that basically Apollo 13 education in a weekend on the weekend of March 14th and 15th. So thank you again, and thank you for being here. So let's get at this topic today about the reading gap and, and how we can close it. And I, and I know that it's very near and dear to everyone's heart. And, and it's not just because I have a PhD in reading, but I, I really believe you know, quite strongly that having uh, uh, developed literacy skills, reading skills, is not just about academic growth and achievement, it's really about life or death. It's about how successful you're going to be in society, how a child's going to be um, uh, performing in their professional, personal uh, life. So for me, it truly is a life or death issue. And so let's look at this, I'm sure you're familiar with the data, is that according to the NAEP or the National Assessment for Educational Progress, only 35% of our kids nationwide in the United States pre-pandemic were reading on grade level, were considering, you know, considered to be proficient readers. And, and the data, you know, in a lot of other countries is, is quite similar. Um, uh, we see a lot of similar patterns. And so third grade reading success in the United States, here's a staggering statistic for you. It has a direct correlation to lifelong success. And so to give you an example of that, I uh, just last summer, I was working in a school district and one of my um, colleagues in that district, her husband actually works for uh, the um, Office of Corrections uh, for the state in which um, I was working. And she shared with us that they were getting ready to do their 10 year predictions and their 10 year predictions, figuring out what they needed for facilities, how many beds they were going to need in the various um, correctional facilities across the state. And what she shared with us at the time and uh, was that third grade assessment data for the schools in the community was their best predictor as to how many beds they were going to need. And of course, many of us know the connection between literacy and performance and probability of incarceration and poverty, all of those things. But when she shared that statistic, you could have heard a pin drop at this meeting. And for me, it just chilled me to the bone. It just made it so raw that uh, really that's what we're looking at. It truly is a life or death issue. So, you know, what happened exactly? Um, why do we have, you know, the fact that only 60, or I'm sorry, 35% of our kids are proficient readers uh, in grades K through 12? And it's not that teachers aren't working hard. I mean, I work in schools all over the United States as a consultant and a, and a colleague. And I taught at the university for 15 years. I was a Chicago public school teacher for 10 years. You know, I've been around the block for a while. All I see is teachers working extraordinarily hard. So what happened? Natalie Wexler took on that question. She's actually a, a, a really kind of well-known reporter. She's done a lot of reporting for the New York Times and she wrote um, The Knowledge Gap which I highly recommend. It's probably one of um, a, a book for me in my professional life that has had the most impact on me in the last 10 years. And what she did is that she took on this question. You know, we keep doing these reforms and we keep doing um, uh, different kinds of programs and such to address the achievement gap, but what exactly is happening? And, and she really honed in on, on what 
has happened in education in our schools and why we're not seeing growth and achievement. And it's not that folks aren't working hard enough. We all know how hard we work as educators. But what's happened is that there's this overemphasis on skills. That's what she's taught, what she identifies. And there's a lot of other educators and research, um, uh, reading researchers in the field that have also pointed to that too, is that there's an overemphasis on skills and less emphasis on content knowledge or background knowledge. And one of the things that's troubling to me is I see less and less and less as, as far as instruction is concerned in the disciplines of having a robust arts curriculum, having physical education, teaching content areas like social studies and science. And it's almost as if we have this overemphasis now on reading and math because that's what is that's right, tested. And so there, we've gotten a little, you know, we've gotten kind of myopic. So the example that I give all the time is that if you will, as a five foot three middle-aged woman, that I'm a basketball coach and I have my basketball team and I'm gonna teach them how to be a really awesome team. And we're gonna be the best in our division. We're gonna accomplish all these great things and, and just win all the time. So I start off where I wanna teach them skills. So I teach them how to dribble, I teach them how to pass, I teach them ball handling, all of that. But that's all I do. And I never let them do anything besides the skills that they're going to learn in various isolated drills. And so when they go and they actually play a game, they don't perform as well. And it's because we never contextualize those skills. We never use those skills in a larger context. And it's not all that dissimilar when we talk about reading. So if we keep talking about what is the main idea or the controlling idea and cite the evidence that's in the text, but kids aren't reading longer works and more, then that's the problem. And it's interesting when the new standards came out in 2010, whether your state uses Common Core or a variation of it, or they have their own standards like in Texas or Florida and very other, you know, various other states, they, they, they do emphasize skills, but almost every single one of them, without exception, has an introduction to the standards that, that says quite plainly that the skills have to be contextualized within the instruction of content, that it's to build background knowledge. Okay, so this is what Wexler really identified. So there's this belief that we have that the performance gap that we have been, you know, that has been vexing us now for decades is really caused by skills, by the fact that kids have lack of skills. But what we're finding is, is that that may not be true. That may not be completely accurate. So reading tests have become the yardstick and 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 those are the, the 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 what am I trying to say the litmus test as to whether or not a child is a good reader and we're going to talk more about that in a second. So one of the the places that she um, or countries that she identifies is in France and France had a real educational shift and, and France isn't the only one and you may have heard of maybe like Edie Hirsch um, I, I, and, and various others who keep talking about content and that we have to have rich content in the curricula in order to develop um, uh, really profound reading skills. And I believe in that completely, but I wanna be careful about that too, because I'm not saying some content matters more than others. I'm saying content matters. So we also have to be culturally sens sensitive, contextually sensitive as well. And let me say something too about our ELL learners. Imagine as a child coming into the United States and you're learning English and English is so rich with idiomatic expressions and background knowledge that if you don't have a piece of information, you're gonna miss out. You're not gonna understand you know, what's, what's actually happening. And there's so much of that in our English language. Um, so here's, here's really a, a great example that Natalie Wexler identifies. And she talks about um, France and, and what happened in France. And prior to 1987, all French schools were required to adhere to a detailed content-focused national curriculum, okay? That was um, uh, what everybody was following in the country and, and there was just a lot of content. And then the French, you know, looked at each other and they say, you know, there's such disparity and there's equity issues. So, you know, we really need to address that. And what they thought 
that they were doing that was going to help the situation is that they created a new law and this was at about the turn of the century in about like you know 2000 they encourage elementary schools to adopt more of an American approach. Um, so foregrounding skills such as critical thinking and learning, uh, learning to learn, finding the main idea, um, those sorts of things. So it became more skills based as opposed to content rich. And so they flipped it basically. And so you know where this is going, right? This is what happened. The results were absolutely dramatic. Over the next 20 years, achievement levels decreased sharply for all students. Their intention was to bridge that gap between um, children of poverty, um, disadvantaged kids to higher socioeconomic status, middle class, um, uh, upper class, and they were trying to close up those achievement gaps because we see this all the time too in the United States. When you look at that NAEP data, and it shows that only 35% of our kids are proficient readers, if you add in the factor of poverty, it goes down to only 10%. Only 10% of our kids nationwide who receive, who are on the list for free and reduced lunch are actually reading on level. And that to me, especially as a literacy educator, is is horrifying to me um so over the next 20 years when they had this they they adopted in like 1998 1999 um over 20 years achievement levels started decreasing sharply for all kids and the drop was the greatest among the neediest and the interesting thing about it we've looked at a lot of vocabulary studies and head start and the United States has done a substantial body of research about words exposed, exposure to language, and that children of poverty have less exposure. And that really translates into their academic performance. So, so, so we have this skills versus content kind of dilemma that's going on that nobody is really talking about directly. And it's interesting because when I've shared this and I've done this at keynotes at various conferences and discussed it in the last year, um, many teachers are like, yeah, amen, sister, because you know what? We've been dealing with this. We know that that's true. And, and so when we're not developing background knowledge in consort with developing skills, that's the issue, okay? We're gonna, gonna give you some more examples and some more evidence of, of that as well. So before we delve into background knowledge and content knowledge and how it closes the achievement gap in students, um, I want to um, uh, uh, ask you, uh, I, wanna, I wanna go into this first actually. So, and, and it's the idea of text complexity. So a lot of us are using in our schools, in our districts, we're using a Lexile score, or we might be using an AR score or something like that. And I wanna address the concept of text complexity and where background knowledge and content knowledge fits within that model. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about this right now. So I wanna make it clear. I cannot think of a state right now um, and, and including, you know, I know we have some folks from British Virgin Islands and also Canada online right now. I cannot think of any, um, uh, you know, including BVI and also Canada, I can't think of anybody who's not using this example because it's really one that's adopted um, in the reading community, that this is what text complexity actually is. So a lot of times I'll go into districts and we'll talk about text complexity and all folks are talking about is Lexile scores, okay? So here's the deal. Think about text complexity as a three-legged stool. And there's three components to it. The first is quantitative measures. The second is qualitative dimensions. And the third is reader and task considerations, okay? So those of you who also have a math background too, it's all 33.3333333%. One is not more than the other. Notice that they're all equal because they're supporting that seat of text complexity. Okay, so here's what that means. So quantitative measures, one of our best measures in the industry is Lexile. Lexile is actually great for a lot of reasons, okay? And those of you who are old timers like me, who have been around for a couple of uh, decades, you might remember Fry's readability graph. So just for fun, um, those of you out there, that question area, if you remember Fry's readability graph, just give me a yes or a, um, a shout out on that because, um, uh, there are some of us around there, but it was literally a graph and you counted how many words were in a passage and the length of the words and the frequency of the words and that determined 
grade level. So quantitative measures are, um, uh, some examples of that are word length and frequency. And as I said, Lexile happens to be one of our best measures in the industry. And it's usually, and Lexile is determined by um, computer software. And there's a formula for it. And it's actually based on Fry's readability graph, you know, from a long time ago. Okay, not to get all geeky. But anyway, so texts that have um, a lot of uh, discipline specific uh, vocabulary, language, get really jargony, tend to have a higher Lexile score. So one of the highest Lexile scores that I see are in CT classes or vocational ed classes. So I was in Little Shoot, Wisconsin, and I was doing a quick, you know, kind of Lexile analysis on a welding text that the welding teacher used. And it was off the charts. It was over 1300 because there was so much technical language. Okay. Literature tends to score lower. And that's because the nature of literature and narrative text is that you repeat words or vocabulary or the names of places or characters. So it tends to score lower. And I remember reading in the Atlantic, a English professor was harping on the fact that with Common Core, we're dummying down literature. Well, he didn't read the entire appendix of, of the Common Core document that goes into all of this about text complexity. And he was citing the fact that um, uh, Great Gatsby was considered to be a seventh grade level. Well, that's the Lexile. That's not text complexity. That's only one of the three part component. Okay. So sentence length, text cohesion are also factors too. Quantitative measures get at the decoding. They get at the word level. And I bet many of you have students where they can quote unquote read the text. So they go across the text and you start talking to them about what the text is about or possibly interpreting it. And they look at you and they go, er? exactly. So, so it's really about decoding. Decoding is is not getting into that deeper comprehension and let me chat about that for a moment so the second component is qualitative dimensions and that means levels of meaning particularly with literary texts so poetry um i i i and this is why literature belongs in the curriculum because we get into those inferential meanings those metaphorical meanings abstract so reading literary text isn't just you know because English teachers think you should do it, it actually is important for developing that reading muscle. And then purpose is usually what we see in informational text. Is it like that welding text to teach somebody how to weld? Or is it um, uh, to learn about the eruption in Mount St. Helens? Like what's the purpose of that text? And then text structures is the next one. That has to do with looking at different text structures. So how I read a science research article is different than how I read an Elizabethan sonnet, is different than how I read a short story, is different than I, when I read a blog post, right? And there's actually some very interesting things that are um, some research, not, not to go down a wormhole, about reading on a screen and then actually reading something that's paper-based. There's actually quite a difference. And maybe that's a topic for another webinar, but there's some really important research that's coming out on that, especially with the e-learning that we're doing and what's happening in COVID-19. And then the last qualitative um, uh, characteristics of, uh, or element um, that feeds into qualitative dimensions is language conventionality and clarity. So a child from the 21st century is gonna have a harder time re reading the federal papers and something from written by Alexander Hamilton in the 1700s. Um, a kid from Illinois, from Chicago, my hometown, is going to have a harder time reading something that's in Southern dialect than a kid from Mississippi. Okay, so language conventionality and clarity. A kid whose first language is Spanish is going to have some difficulty with the noun adjective sequence that is in English because it's reversed, right? And and same thing. A child who is whose native language is Arabic, I got to flip it. I don't read left to right. My tendency, my, my innate um, uh, uh, disposition is to read from right to left. So all of those factors figure into it. And then the last element, that third leg, is reader and task considerations. That's motivation, 
um, knowledge about a topic, experience, um, tasks to be considered, uh, taking into account when you're when you're reading it. And and usually those assessments are made are 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 done best by the teacher. So motivation, motivation, motivation. The other thing I want to add with qualitative dimensions, and it also fits in with reader and task considerations, is background knowledge. Background knowledge is epic. It is the biggest difference in our, or the most determining factor that once you know how to decode a text, your background knowledge has a tremendous amount of impact on how you're able to understand a text and how you're able to interpret it. Now, we're all educators, so we're all super, super smart. So to illustrate that, it's always a challenge for me because we're so smart. We know so, so many different things. So I'm going to give you something right now. Um, that, you know, how much background knowledge and content matters. So, you know, knowing things about Shakespeare and, you know, Julius Caesar and the Supreme Court. My husband and I talk about this all the time. And, and you know, we don't have as much social studies content or civics that's taught right now in our schools. And I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides. But he had a, a Boy Scout troop for years. I had a Girl Scout troop. And one of the things that, that they would ask when they were working on their civics badge, he would say, you know, what is... Um, uh, 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 name like the 50th state or any states, you know, any states. And he would get Mexico, Guam, um, Virgin Islands. Um, I don't know if it was American Virgin Islands or British Virgin Islands, but, but like kids don't even know what the 50 states are. That's background knowledge, right? Um, uh, knowing about like mammals and the rainforest, um, somebody like uh, um, uh, Muhammad Ali, and not just the fact that he was a boxer, but also a huge civil rights advocate, learning about the globe, the seven contents, uh, contents, a lot of continents, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, not even understanding that Australia is a continent as well as a country. Uh, and, then, and then just our history with, you know, perhaps the Pony Express, you know, Dr. King, Amelia Earhart, all of this is background knowledge. I find it incredibly ironic that we're in the information age, yet our reading performance is going down. And one of the determining factors of that is access to content study and discipline specific study. It's so ironic to me um, that this is happening. So here's a quick video that I wanna share with you. It's from Dan Willingham. Dan Willingham, I have kind of an intellectual crush on Dan Willingham. And, and he is actually a cognitive psychologist at a University of Virginia. And he's done a lot of work about background knowledge and cognition and reading actually. And, and just so you know too, the field of reading actually comes out of psychology that happened you know, in the late 50s, early 60s. So there's a big psychology um, uh, connection with the science of reading as well. And I wanna show you this short clip just so you can see uh, how your background knowledge impacts your ability to comprehend text, okay? So here we go, get ready for the video. And here we go. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, there we go.
So, so you didn't miss the rest of the video. That's kind of it because I want to illustrate it. And this is actually Dan Willingham, Willingham's um, video. And and here's the whole video right here. And of course, it's in the handouts as well. You know, you can watch the whole thing because it's about an eight minute video. And he does such a stellar job um, as far as is illustrating how much you use your background knowledge and you're not even aware of it. And here's another thing too. Out of first graders nationwide in the United States, what percentage of students do you think in first grade today uh, receive social studies content? And just write it in the question area. You know, what percentage do you think that um, of first graders in the United States have social studies content? Tell me. Give you guys a, an opportunity to respond there. I'm going to jump in here, Katie, and let you know that I see 10%, 10%, 3%, 30%. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, getting a delay. Okay, so not to be Debbie Downer, it's even less than that. It's less than 5%. And, and this is also true of science content. And in third grade, it doesn't get much better. Fifth grade, it's more around like 4 or 5%. So if we're not teaching social studies science content in particular, and kids are not reading in those disciplines, that is pretty staggering. Now, there are notable exceptions. This is a nationwide, this is an aggregate um, percentage that we're looking at. So I'm sure many of you are in schools or districts where you are teaching social studies and science content. But, but a big contributor is that when, when we don't have rich content, then that is going to create um, uh, big performance gaps. It's gonna create big gaps in our um, proficiency in reading, okay? And so, um, uh, so there's a whole video if you wanna take a look at it. And, and it's also based on uh, his work too, his additional resources too, I gotta give him a shout out. The Reading Mind is, is a really outstanding book and it's about the cognition of reading and understanding how the mind reads. We're actually, as human beings, we're not hardwired for reading. It's something that we've learned and adapted to, um, I, that we've learned and adapted to. It's not something that's innate for us as human beings. And that really changed after the invention of the um, printing press. And then his other one too is why don't students like school? And uh, really he's getting at the fact, you know, gosh, surprise, you know, we spend too much time um, with assessments and not, quote unquote, what kids will say, real learning. Um, they don't see doing uh, um, skills all the time as real learning. And I have to give a shout out. I see um, there's somebody from Guayaquil, um, Ecuador, and um, had the, the joy of being in Ecuador a couple of years ago. And uh, what a beautiful country. So just a little side sidebar there. And then um, this is a book that I co-authored with a middle school reading intervention teacher. And you know, what do you do? You know, because in middle school and high school in particular, our kids can generally decode. If if the kids are not decoding text, then that's a whole other issue. There's usually an undiagnosed disability like dyslexia, which outside of the early grades, the highest incidence of identification of dyslexia is usually in middle school because the kids have learned how to self-accommodate. And then when the texts start getting harder and harder, um, uh, it, it, the, 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 the fact that they've been self-accommodating um, really becomes true. We also see too a massive drop off that begins to happen in fifth grade, but really comes crashing in seventh grade as far as reading performance. And a lot of that again has to do with the fact that kids are deep diving into the disciplines and, and they have to be pretty proficient with their reading skills and developing background knowledge if they're going to understand a biology text. If kids don't understand, like, for instance, the three different kinds of matter and, and they're reading something in a seventh, seventh grade science text about matter, they're at a deficit. They don't have that background knowledge. That text is not going to make sense. So that book that I co-authored with Lisa 
uh, Hallahan Allen, she's a, um, a reading interventionist in, in northern Wisconsin, you know, we really got into, you know, what do you do when your kids are still having issues with decoding and they're in middle school? Um, so, so there's um, uh, that resource as well. And then, of course, I'm always working to figure out ways, a lot of times in the older grades, colleagues will say, well, I'm a science teacher and I have to teach science content. Yes, of course you do. Um, and and, and the, they might say something like, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, um, I, I don't have time to teach reading. Well, you're not teaching reading, you're teaching comprehension in your discipline. That's what you're doing. And so I don't expect you to be a reading teacher in the sense of like a first grade reading teacher, but I do expect you to develop comprehension. So, so the Literacy and Learning Center model that I developed really gets into how do we teach reading, writing, speaking, listening, the literacy skills in consort with the content? And what a lot of teachers, um, what I found, because this really grew out of work that I do in classrooms and working with, with teachers, is over the scope of 10 years and developing this model, is that um, uh, discipline-specific teachers, whether they're a Spanish language teacher, or uh, a welding teacher, or they teach ELA or math or science, what they find is that when they go to this model, they're actually able to teach more content, more of their discipline than they would otherwise. And why is that? Is because the kids are learning skills for comprehension and being able to express what they know about comprehension within that discipline. That's the secret sauce. Um, so that's there as, as, as well as a resource for you. Now, I got another question for you, okay? How many of you, well, this isn't, this is just kind of the, 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 the teaser question, then I'm gonna give you the real question. So how many of you have um, been told over and over and over again that we have to get ready for the, the test and the way to get kids ready for the test is that they have to learn how to do a cold read. They have to be able to pick up you know, any kind of text, right? And be able to read it and then make sense of it and express what they know and understand about that text. So I wanna ask you, my friends, my colleagues, how many of you, um, well, let me rephrase it. Can you think of a time when you completed a cold reading in any context other than a standardized test? And just go ahead and, and, and type it in the question area. Can you think of any time that you completed a cold reading or were asked to do a cold reading for any other purpose other than a standardized test? For me personally, the last time I did cold readings was when um, I was taking my graduate record exam to apply for my, my, for my doctoral program. That was like, oh my gosh, now I'm really dating myself. It was like 25 years ago. And outside of that, I can't think of one, but I'm really curious, you know, what are, what are we saying here? I don't know if you can see too, Liz, kind of the responses. My my control panel is kind of hiccupy over here. Yes, I see lots of no's. I don't yeah. think so. Someone said during a professional development, they had to do a cold read. Yeah. Um, <laughs> staff meetings, staff that's meetings beautiful. and PDs, staff meetings and PDs, otherwise, no, not at all. That's pretty much the gist. Yeah, and so so here's the deal, okay? It makes no sense, right? Who's telling us to do cold readings? Who's telling us that we have to teach kids to do cold readings and it's not authentic reading? I, I, I can't think of any other profession besides ours as, as teachers, as educators, as principals. We're the only profession that I can think of where outsiders dictate our practice. It makes no sense. And when I said that, the last time I said that at a keynote, the room went nuts in a very positive way. So, so I wish I could hear everybody on the, on the webinar right now because um, I, it, it's really kind of staggering, right? And, and so we know that this is an authentic reading. This is authentic reading, you know, picking up a graphic novel and reading it or learning about like women in combat because I'm interested in that topic or, I just um, I, I have to fill out my taxes and I have to do my itemized deductions and, and fill that out. That's still contextual. Here's why you can't depend on just Lexile, getting back to text complexity. Lexile just gets at decoding and there's, that's only one third of the whole text complexity model. 
if you you can't just rely on Lexile to determine um, uh, what text to assign to kids, okay? And here's why. Captain Underpants, okay? Do you know that one? I loved reading Captain Underpants with my grandson, okay? Captain Underpants and Dogman too. That one's really funny too. Captain Underpants has the same Lexile score as Twilight, okay? Here's another one for you. Um, Hunger Games has a lower Lexile score than Stuart Little. So this is why Lexile, you know, just taking that and not looking at kids' backgrounds and what they might be interested in and the purpose for their reading and making it meaningful, authentic, and inspiring, we're missing a lot of it. And that's what's causing this gap. When we keep giving kids cold reads, they're not reading enough. And that was one of the reasons that, that prompted Common Core. The whole idea was that we needed to read and write more within the disciplines. And how do you encourage that? The kids weren't reading enough. Well, you encourage it by choice. So let me give you another example. I was in a seventh grade class this last spring, and we were looking at the skill of cause and effect. We took a mentor text that was grade level, and it was about the eruption of Mount St. Helens back in the 80s, okay? So we looked at cause and effect, but one of the things I wanted the kids to understand is that effects are not all created equal. And we were addressing an essential question, and the essential question was, how can a natural event create unexpected consequences? Wow, we're like living that right now. But this was back in January that I did this. And then the kids had three different texts that they could group based on that. We did the mentor first on Mount St. Helens. And then they took that graphic organizer and they took different texts. One was on um, uh, uh, the pandemic in, or not the pandemic, the epidemic in China and Wuhan that virus and now of course we're experiencing that worldwide so the coronavirus then another one was on um the 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 um uh increase of locusts in western africa and the third was on garbage island in the pacific and the kids had to take that event or what was happening and how it was impacting or what the effects were and what the kids found is that when they looked at the social um, effects, the environmental, the um, uh, economic, that there were actually connections between them. Because those of us as adults, we know that cause and effects, they're not all equal. All the effects are not equal. There is actually a layer of complexity. And that's what we wanted the kids to get. And the kids will always say that they love having choice. They love being able to be grouped that way. Um, uh, but I always say it's a democratic choice, you know, or democratic dictatorship. You're, you're gonna have choice, but they're gonna be the choices that I give you because they're gonna fit in to my essential question and then the skill that we're working on as well. So, you know, as, as, as educators, I mean, I would love to see us, you know, the more we can fight back about this cold reading stuff and preparing kids for a test it's really about great literature it's about reading exposure to reading and giving kids the opportunity to practice those skills within the context of larger texts and reading so dan willingham actually has i've read a lot of his work and and have seen him speak many times but according to the research that he's done and other cognitive psychologists and quite a few other reading researchers there is a debate in the in the reading community about this about how much is too much when you're talking about skills and willingham says yes skills are important so if you come out of this webinar and says oh katie mcknight says that we shouldn't teach skills anymore that's not what i'm saying i'm i'm just like willingham in the sense that there's a threshold. If we keep teaching the same skill over and over and over again, like that basketball analogy that I had, we're never gonna get ready to play the game because that's all that we're doing is practicing how to dribble, but then we never play the game. So we really know that we've made the impact on kids and their reading success when they know when and how to use the skills that we're teaching them. And how do they develop that? When they read more. That's the simple secret sauce to it. Um, and, and I've been in, in so many schools where when we start doing that and giving kids choice in text and it's carried through all courses, not just in the ELA class, 
that is when we start seeing huge shift and we start seeing double digit gains in, in reading performance um, um, of our students. So, you know, the impact of testing, I think one of the best outcomes of the pandemic is that testing got canceled this year. And that's, again, I'm listening to everybody online right now. This is where we all cheer. The amount of anxiety and stress that high stakes testing is causing in the schools where I work is just unbelievable. And what it's doing is then it's crippling our ability to have kids delve deeply into content because we're so um, bullied by these standardized tests. Um, so when students take standardized reading text, tests, they're not contextualized. And I always argue that there's no such thing as a fair or reliable reading test. And it's because of the cultural implications of reading or the cultural connection. So it's very curious, isn't it, that the states with the highest reading achievement tend to be the most demographically homogeneous states in the United States. I find that very curious. So, you know, I grew up in Chicago. Um, I grew up in a city. So a kid who grows up in the city and they're going to be reading a text about living on a farm, they're at a deficit because they don't have that background knowledge. And the same is true conversely. I hear that all the time, teachers in rural communities, the kids will be given uh, a text on a reading assessment and they start talking about a subway in New York. The kids don't have that contextualization, they don't have that background, and they're immediately at a, at a, at a disadvantage on that reading assessment. And think about our English language learners in particular, you know, children Children who may have come from Bosnia or Poland or wherever, and 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 they don't have that background knowledge that's going to give them the key that 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 pathway into the text, and they're really designed that way because the idea is is that they don't want any one group to have an advantage over another. But when you create cold readings, it's not authentic reading. We don't really. That's not how how we read. That's not what we really engage in. Yet. For some reason, that's where our instruction is right now in so many schools. Not all of them, there are notable exceptions without a doubt. And it's really this impact of standardized testing is what I would argue. So often what happens is that in instruction is really focused on skills. This has been my experience in a lot of schools in, in, in pretty much all the schools where I work in. And it's usually paired with a reading. So it's usually like maybe you know, a few pages and that's it. And the kids have to find the main idea or the text structures or find the figurative language or something like that, or what the claim is in, in the text and the supporting evidence. And, and again, it's about pages read. Once kids know how to decode, the secret sauce is pages read, pages read, pages read. Let me say it again, it's about pages read. And this is where I gotta give a, a shout out to Saddleback. I've loved Saddleback for many, 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 many years. And, and it's because they make text accessible to kids. And that's actually next week, we're gonna talk about differentiating text. And I'm gonna take that one on. And, and we know that there's quite a bit of debate about grade level text and differentiating text as instructional practice. And I'm gonna take that one on, two guesses of where I land on that one. And, um, uh, uh, but that's one of the reasons why I like Saddleback is that it's it's inviting kids in. And, and once we pull kids in, I've seen some of the lowest level readers in a middle school reading intervention class. And when we set it up where kids are reading text, it changes their lives and, and they become excited about reading. Um, I, I always oftentimes say this with um, middle school reading interventionists in particular, everything about reading intervention in middle school and high school is emotional. It's so emotional because the kids know that they're not good readers. Um, and, and there's such an emotional um, stigmatization that goes with that. So this is, um, I'm sure you've seen something very similar. This is um, Negan Herman's um, study that was, gosh, you know, um, uh, uh, um, about 15 years ago. Uh, no, it's more than that, I'm sorry, uh, 35 years ago. And about your exposure to words, um, if you read 20 minutes a day, reading as opposed to reading one minute a day, if anything in this pandemic, if we just have kids read, um, if you read one hour a day, kids will um, uh, perform in the 98th percentile on most reading assessments. So just one hour, and it doesn't have to be a full one hour. It could be 20 minutes here, 20 minutes here, 20 minutes here. Um, that's fine. And it's about pages read. 
my good friend Leanne Nicholson and I actually took on um, this article. And if you're going to come next week, when we talk about differentiating text, um, you might want to read this uh, article. And it's um, literacy piece because we've heard uh, or make reading piece, making literacy piece, um, and what's important for developing readers. And 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 you know, Leanne and I are really taking the stance of you know, it's not about mentor text, grade level text, or differentiated text. It's about both. It's about making text accessible and growing our kids. And we're gonna delve into that next week um, in greater detail, but uh, an article there to share uh, with you as, as well. Um, that's my contact information, all my digits. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm not running around in airports right now, so please feel free to contact me. And uh, again, you know, really the gap. I I think uh, Wexler and and Willingham and and you know that camp have really hit the nail on the head. Is that we've gotten myopic about teaching skills, and our skills need to be contextualized in the teaching of content. And too many of our of our um, uh, uh, especially the littles, you know, the little guys are not getting that background. So when they come to us in middle school and high school, they don't have that foundational background knowledge. And let me just share very briefly, um, my grandson, who's who's seven years old, smart as a whip, big reader, um, you know, it's because his grandmother keeps foisting books on him, but uh, he's turned into quite a voracious reader. And I remember saying to him, um, this was last fall, and, and we were talking about school and what he was doing. He's in second grade. And I said, oh, what are you reading in school today? And he tells me what he's reading. What are you working on in math? And he tells me in math. And I said, what did you do in social studies? And he says, oh, no, no, we don't do any social studies. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, what do you do in second grade? Well, I'm like, did you learn about communities? Did you learn about different countries? He's like, oh, no, we don't do that. And then I and then I looked at him again and I said, well, what did you do in science? And he says, oh, no, no, we don't we don't have science. And I said, well, what do you do all day? And then he says to me, he says, Katie, we read out of the big book and I look at him. And I'm thinking, you know, big book, you know, growing up by uh, um, uh, Catholic, you know, attended a all girls Catholic high school back in the day. I'm like, does, does he mean like a religious text? And what he was referring to was a basal reader. And that's all he's reading. And I said, don't you read books like we do? Like when we read Captain Underpants and things like that? He says, no, we don't. And then I asked him about writing and does he do any writing? And he said, no. And at that point I lost it and grandma got really involved and, and we started creating readers theater and stories and things like that. And, and it just breaks my heart, you know, that um, uh, here is my grandson and he's not getting that exposure. But I will say there are exceptions to that. I've also been in schools where, where they're very, very rich in developing disciplinary um, background knowledge, uh, cultural connection and such. And guess what? Those are generally the high performing schools. So I'm going to turn it back over to Liz on that note, because I'm sure we've got some questions. We definitely have some questions. I'm going to um switch screens here because we want to let everybody know about your webinar next week and I think this is pertinent because one of the questions that came in or one of the comments that came in actually which really struck me was somebody was uh, I don't have it in front of me so I don't have it verbatim but the the gist of it was this is great information this all makes sense but I feel like there's nothing I can do about this like uh, this is helping me understand the environment I'm maneuvering within, but what can I what what can I do about it? Uh, and so, for that person and anybody else who may be thinking that same thing, um, I would really encourage you to join us next week, where Katie will be on again, and she's going to talk about um, differentiating text uh, and really just reconfirm this idea that it is a good instructional practice and give you some ideas for what your instruction can look like to help build some of that content and background knowledge. And step in here if if I'm getting any of that wrong, Katie. Do you have anything you wanted to add about next week? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. And, you know, to get back to that question, too, you know, I hear that frustration. And, you know, like like all of us, you know, I'm having up days and down days during the pandemic. And when I'm having kind of a down day, I think to myself, OK, conversations that we've needed to had and have an education for quite some time. This pandemic is forcing the issue. And so when we go back to brick and mortar schools, we all know that we're going to have children way behind. 
I'm going to tell you right now, and you can blame it all on me. You can say, well, Katie McKnight said that, that it is about reading more. And, and if we continue on the path that we're going, we're going to create an even larger one. The research is very concrete, it's very clear. There's a lot of naysayers and they're very loud naysayers about differentiating text and just giving kids grade level text. I encourage you to read that article that Leanne and I wrote because it is documented intensely on research that supports the differentiation of text. And, and what I find is, is that the more of us who speak out against it, and, and this is where I need to take my role, and especially, you know, I want to thank Saddleback for giving me the platform, you know, to, to, to spouse on this, is that the more we address it and we are equipped with the research and the knowledge to back it up, I think we're a very, very powerful force. Um, and, and, and one of which I'm very proud, especially during Teacher Appreciation Week, to be part of our profession. We're Absolutely. the change. Yeah. yeah, we're the ones who mess up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so. so those of you who are uh, interested, hopefully all of you who are interested in joining us next week, you will get an email uh, inviting you to register or you can go right to our website, sdlback.com slash webinar series and you can register there for that. We had a lot of questions come in, uh, far too many that we can get to uh, uh, live today, but I wanted to start with this one because this person was giving a shout out to your Learning and Literacy Center books, uh, but they wanted to know, um, what are your thoughts on um, those instructional techniques during distance learning? Did you have anything, you, any tips you wanted to share about um, kind of the broader ideas in those books and how they might apply to this time we're living in? Yeah, okay, so everybody, let's do this. Do not take another thing on right now. Just don't do it. But <laughs> um, I, but with that said, I actually did a webinar um, a while back, and and you know maybe you know represented or something like that about taking the literacy and learning center model and use some in the, some of the great tools that are out there and how you can take some of those principles and those you know multiple you know foci of instruction and um, I, I, um, you know put that in an e-learning platform so yes there are definite things that you can can do I would love to share that with you um, you can contact me directly or maybe that's something you know um, talking to Saddleback or such that we can do that in the future of just literacy and learning centers or just developing reading and writing skills in the disciplines in an e-learning context. But I'm begging you, do not take another thing on right now. This is something to think about for the fall. And 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 honestly, once we're all done with e-learning and the end of, of the school year, um, the only thing that you need to worry about for at least a week is how many pillows you need on your couch and what time your afternoon nap is going to be. That's the priority. <laughs> Um, because we're all fried, right? And and you need that time to regroup and rest up so we're good for our students, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to, there are a lot of questions that are very similar, so what I'm trying to do is uh, cast a wide net and, and combine some of these things and maybe have you speak on them. We had a lot of questions around specifically supporting struggling readers in high school and how to get them motivated, um, along with questions around um, how this information applies to students who are new to the country but may not have any literacy in their in their native language. So uh, particularly older students. So um, yeah. if you could speak to that for a moment and hopefully we can um, address a little bit of of those all those questions that were coming in around those topics. Sure. Um, okay, so so here's the deal. You know, as I said earlier that you know, so much of reading intervention in middle school and high school, it's all emotional. It's so emotional because, you know, when we have a high schooler in front of you and, and they're reading on maybe a second grade level, um, uh, it's heart wrenching, right? And and I work in schools where maybe, you know, the high school where there's only 12% of the kids who are on level. Here's the good news. If I've got a kid on a Lexile of even 200, here's the good news they can decode. If they can decode, I've got them. If they're not there and they're not on a 200 or 300 Lexile, then that's a decoding issue. That's a whole other problem. And, and there are different programs that, that I would recommend if you wanna contact me personally. 
about you know getting at that decoding if you're dealing with that at a high school situation okay there aren't many reading wonks like me who specialize just in adolescent reading um we're kind of a weird bunch there aren't many of us around but their adolescent reading is different than little so if they're not decoding the way that you teach kids how to read if they missed out on it when they were little is different because of brain development and and other things that are going on so there is a difference and 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 again i'm going to give a shout out to saddleback okay is um uh, i only play with companies that i like <laughs> <Saddleback> <laughs> is, one of them, is that they have all these rich texts that kids can get in and it's about hooking them in how are you going to hook them um if i if i hand you you know this book on droids and robots okay available from saddleback if i give this to you okay and and you're a struggling reader and i say okay i want you to go through each chapter and find out you know what is the main idea and the supporting details well i'm just going to take it i'm like i'm i'm not interested in that but if I talked to you and I said something like an essential question, like, um, I, um, I, is is there a, how can how can artificial intelligence be helpful or detrimental to a society? Ooh, you know, and and you know, there's going to be a kid who's like, oh, in Terminator, they did da 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 da. -da. <laughs> like, yeah. So why not compare it to what I'm learning about droids and robots in a text and then make it an exploration of like, what are the limits of the benefits of artificial intelligence? That's actually the essential question. And, and that is what's interesting. It is not interesting to just give me a graphic organizer and tell me to find the main ideas and the details in the text. What's interesting is addressing that question and I can say, what ideas did you find in chapter one that can help you answer that question? Where is the deficit of information? How I get more? We're naturally curious. High school students are no different. And here's the deal. Computer-based programs, there's actually a Johns Hopkins study on this, um, actually have almost a zero effect. Um, the reading intervention programs that are there that are computer-based. And I'm not gonna go into specific ones or whatever, but generally what we're finding is, is they really don't work. Here's what works giving kids interesting text, having them answer questions. Yes, it is as basic as that, but we have to, to get the decision makers, you know, those of us as teachers and educators and building leaders and principals, we need to get that to be the common understanding rather than the outlier understanding. And, and um, it, there's so, so much research. And I always found too, you know, as a teacher that, um, if I was challenged on some of the things that I was doing, uh, I, I would just start pulling out articles <laughs> and throwing it into, into mailboxes at school. And then generally people left me alone. And, uh, um, but you know, that knowledge really is, is, is powerful. And, and I get it, you know, when you have kids who are that disaffected and they're in high school and middle school, and then they're in a reading intervention class, um, it's rough. A uh, wonderful group of middle school um, interventionists. One of the things that they do is that when they come, when the kids come into class, they always have a fun activity. So to give you an example, because they want the kids to associate coming to this reading intervention class is fun, it's engaging, it's welcoming, it's filled with love. And so one of the things that they would they would show like a picture of a jackalope, and they'd say, "Is this real or not?" And the kids would start debating about the jackalope, whether or not it was real or not. And and the, it was interesting because the interventionist said, oh, we just do something for fun. It's not really academic. And I said, actually, you're teaching them evidence-based argumentation and, mm -hmm. and they don't even realize that they're doing it. Oh, that would be standard writing one, you know, <laughs> chop that one off. And, uh, uh, or they would show a wolfin or, you know, is it morally right to have a liger or a wolfin or breed them that way? And so, or, you know, so they bring in like these curious things for the kids to talk about. And that was their opener. It wasn't a do now where it was, you know, find the three types of figurative language in this paragraph. It was something for, you know, that was total fun. Awesome. We had a lot of people 
we're going to have to have you back for a third webinar, Katie, because a lot of people, <laughs> and this is actually a question that was submitted beforehand too, and then you touched upon it and the, and the comments went crazy. A lot of interest around um, the benefits of reading print versus digital and the research to substantiate uh, that. So I, I know that's kind of a, too big of a topic to, to address now, but there's definitely a lot of audience interest in that. Uh, I wanted yeah. to close out today with a question around um, assessment. Um, we had a few questions around best practices for summative informative assessment um, mm -hmm. for middle school uh, reading gaps and needs. And I, that is kind of a big question too, but um, question too, yeah. but we, uh, I wanted to make sure to float that one out there because it's one thing that we haven't mentioned in our conversation today. And then we, and then we can wrap up. Yeah. Hey, I want to give a shout out to um, a former student of mine, Gerald Cheney. I uh, um, and 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 I see still in the profession. I've been catching him on online. So yay, Gerald! Glad you're here. And my friend Julie Mitchell up in Minnesota. So I see a couple of friends there. Hey. So okay. So that is a big question. <laughs> yes. So, so here's here's the thing is is that whether you use star data, you know, um, uh, you know, something that's district assessment, um, no matter what you use. It's a snapshot, right? And then of course, we all know too, as educators, a lot of the kids, especially when they're online, they just go click, 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 click. They're not really reading it. They're not really answering the questions, right? So those reading assessments are a snapshot of what a kid can do, but it is not the only determining factor as far as reading performance. All data should be triangulated meaning there should be three sources of data. So whether or not I have running records as a reading interventionist or you know, in my classroom, or I had use proficiency scales, or I use a, um, a, a, a published you know, assessment um, uh, platform, those are all snapshots of what the kid can do. And, and I always rely on the teachers because they are the ones who know their kids better than anybody. But there's a lot of, um, I, I always get leery about formative assessments in particular, because if there's one question, for example, on main idea and somebody doesn't get it right, then it's gonna go ding, oh, Liz doesn't know how to find a main idea. But I have Liz in class. She's a main idea finding machine. She knows how to do that, you know? And, and so, so it's a snapshot, it's an insight, but it is not the end all be all. And unfortunately, that's what's happening so much is that we're letting um, uh, these kinds of assessments drive everything rather than being a sensible, well thought out um, model for assessment. All assessment has to be triangulated and it should be valid, reliable, and fair. So a kid who's from Poland and you ask them to read a passage about Cinco de Mayo may have some issues in answering that text because they don't have the background knowledge. And, yeah. and so um, they may not have that background knowledge. And, and there's all kinds of cultural sensitivity issues with that too. Now, here's the thing. When kids read more, I will guarantee this to you. I can actually show you how this is true. When kids read more in a discipline rich context, their reading performance on a summative high stakes assessment will go up a minimum of 12%. And I leave it at that. That's where I dropped the mic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Can you love can you can you sneak one thing in there? Can we can we attribute can we attribute that reading to to print exclusively or or not? I'm just wondering. You know, the, the, the research on, on screen versus print, like the word is still out, but just to give you a little teaser and we can delve more into it, is what we're finding is is that and this is no surprise, is that when we read on screens, we tend to skim. Hmm. And so, you know, we're teaching the Google generation. They're actually champion skimmers. Notice that Evelyn Wood's speed reading is out of business. She's out hmm. of business because we know how to skim text. The issue is slowing down enough to really work with the text and work with meaning. And what the research is showing is that when you read in print, you do that more than when you read on a screen. 
And, and so again, you know, like it's not like one is better than the other. It depends on the purpose. So when you're reading something narrative, there seems to be not a lot of difference between reading an ebook and then reading a paper-based one. But when you're reading for information, um, like, you know, I'm reading like, you know, this book or something like that, then having the, the, the paper version is better because I flip back and forth when I'm reading for information and reading for study, like in a textbook. So, so that's what, you know, but it's still, you know, it, there, there's still a lot of questions about it. And, and, you know, the re, you know, the reading research nerds are working on it right now mm -hmm. and doing studies and stuff on it, but there's, there's a lot still to consider and, um, uh, on that issue. That's really, really interesting. We're definitely going to have to circle back uh, with you, you on that one, because I could, I could talk about that all day. But we have been going now for about an hour, so it's time to wrap up. Uh, don't mm -hmm. forget to follow us on social media uh, at SDL back on Twitter, and then we're on all the socials, so Facebook, um, Pinterest, um, everywhere. We're everywhere, uh, and Katie as well at Literacy World on Twitter. So make sure you follow her and uh, keep tweeting and letting everybody know uh, what a great time you had joining us today. And we will see you next week. Thank you to you, Katie, and thank you to everybody for watching. And we look forward to having you join us next week for part two of this webinar series. Thanks, everybody. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Yes, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you, everybody.